to ask you to I would like to ask you first of all to mute, mute yourself and uh, turn your cameras off and uh, just uh, welcome everybody to our first uh, session of the webinar for water uh, test network uh, today is our session on wastewater i would kindly uh, again like to ask you to mute yourself and also to turn your cameras off um we we will start uh, in uh, in a bit, can you go to the next slide, please, Yelmer? Just some formalities, the webinar will be recorded so we can disseminate it uh, later on. Um, the first uh, speaker will be our uh, project coordinator, Ruth McNeil. She will give us some insight on the Weather Test Network. Then we will go through our speakers, the SME who have been running uh, their technologies with the help of the water test network. First of all, we will do the reuse of uh, toilet paper fibers by Franz D. Rux from Aqua Innovation Network. Then we will do the improvement uh, of the biological removal by Grandmar Sludge with membrane technology by Mark Feyors from Creaqua. Then uh, we will turn to Phosphorus removal by filter tech by Simone Lanclil from ACBA and uh, via electrocoagulation by Kwame Ninkruam <laughs> from Colina, sorry. And then some other removal by Jaco Hookstram from ATCA. And then we will do all the questions at the end of the session. And uh, we can start. Uh, please, I will give the floor to Rod McNeil, our project coordinator of the Water Test Network. Thank you. Thanks, Francisca, and um, well done on getting those names. I wouldn't have even tried, if I'm honest with you. <laughs> Sorry um, for that. So no. So as Francisca mentioned, I'm the um, project coordinator for the Water Test Network. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the project. And um, then I'll hand over to um, the innovators so that we can hear about some of the technologies that have been tested through our network. So the Water Test Network is a transnational collaboration. We've created a network of testing facilities across Northwest Europe. We're made up of seven partners, five subpartners, and five associated partners from across six countries in Northwest Europe. We were um, allocated funding through Interreg's um, Northwest Europe program under their thematic priority for innovation. And we receive um, European Regional Development Fund co-financing of 60% of our 6 million euro project. So it's our goal to speed up market uptake of innovative water technology by making it easier to test and verify innovations in order to overcome the reluctance over unproven technologies that we often get in within our sector. We do this through our transnational network of testing facilities, which enables SMEs to fine tune and test their technologies in a real setting so they can develop products that are market ready and linked to key sector needs. The project does come to an end in, on the 6th of December this year, um, so our application process um, for support closes in, in the summer. So SMEs from across Europe can access our 14 operational testing facilities with a wide range of water types and applications. So the map um, on the slide there shows the, the approximate location of our 14 testing um, facilities. We've got one in France, one in Germany, two in Belgium seven in the Netherlands and three in Scotland. So under the project, we committed to um, create a number of new and enhanced transnational clusters or innovation networks. So um, in order to do this, we, we created our test facility directory um, and this allows SMEs to be able to easily locate information on the testing facilities that we have, which can help them find the best fit facility for them. So it's all about finding the, the best facility that will help them test their product in a real setting. We've also helped create 
um, two new testing facilities. Um, so we've got um, VeggieTech in Belgium and the Wastewater Treatment and Resource Recovery Center in the Netherlands, which have both been created with support from the project. And we've also supported the enhancement of some lab facilities at the James Hutton Institute in Scotland. So the idea behind these improvements in innovation networks and transnational clusters is that um, they uh, improving them will allow improve access to facilities knowledge and networks so that SMEs find it easier to test and verify their innovations. But our main way of um, our main purpose of the project has been providing access to the facilities by for SMEs. So we've done this in two main ways. Um, we've done this through innovation challenges. Um, these are problems which were experienced by water users and which we have gone to SMEs to try and find an innovative solution. We've engaged the SMEs in a meet the buyer type of exercise. So we launched five of these innovation challenges um, throughout the project and we've completed all five. So um, one was on sludge processing, another was on pharmaceutical removal, another on PFAS removal, generating value from brines, and then the final one was on digital solutions for energy efficiency. But our main area of support has been through innovation support vouchers, which is um, an open application process. This, is, uh, this means that SMEs can come from across Europe to apply and receive um, access to our network of testing facilities. So, um, so far um, at this point in the project, we've received 128 applications from, from companies. Um, we have provided 96 um, SMEs with some kind of support. Um, so 96 of those 128 have received some support in terms of it could be providing some advice on if their technology is trial ready. Um, it could, and it can go all the way through to helping them to design a trial plan for them to go forward onto testing. So 39 of the 96 um, technologies that have received support so far have started or um, have completed testing at one of our 14 testing facilities. So we've, um, we've completed 27 tests of technologies um, and we have 12 currently on site at one of the 14 testing facilities at the moment. And as you can see from that map there, we have had applications from across um, Europe, which is um, fantastic. And they have moved between countries as well. Um, so there is that has been that transnational aspect. Um, the technologies have, sorry, I've gone too far. The technologies tested um, through the water test network have varied as well. So um, they, they can be from phosphorus removal um, using microalgae, um, treatment systems for recycling water, sensor and screening technologies, thickening technologies. And you'll hear today um, from some of the innovators uh, around wastewater technologies. And we have a webinar later on in June where we'll talk to some innovators who have water and monitoring technologies. So there, there will be some, some um, more information on that webinar in the coming weeks. But the, um, we are sadly coming up to the final year of the project. Um, as I said, it, it, it closes um, on the 6th of December this year. So um, part of our focus this year will be considering what um, the Water Test Network's business model is going to be like um, once we've um, finished our interreg project. So the partners are looking at our structure and whether we would extend our facilities to new sectors new locations and a wider market of innovators. So extending our reach outside of the SMEs. Um, as we enter into 2023, um, we um, hope um, we have established the Water Test Network as a sustainable network that can continue to provide valuable innovation support to many others um, for many years to come. Um, so I will hand over back to Francisca now. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Ruth, for your nice insight on the Water Test Network and to see all these uh, beautiful numbers about the technology that have been uh, able to perform some tests thanks to the Interreg project. Thank you. So we will move forward to our next speaker, uh, Franz Dirux. Dirieu. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not a problem. I'm, I'm very curious to, to see your presentation and to see how we can recover uh, cel the cellulose of our toilet paper in the wastewater. Thank you, Franz.
Thank you. I have shoot of control now. Hi there. Thank you for the opportunity to present the ICABUS technology to you. My name is Frans de Rieu. I work for Purgatoria, and we have developed the ICABUS technology for cellulose recovery from wastewater. Yeah. Oh, it kind of works. People in the Netherlands use about one roll of toilet paper per week. This means that every week, 17 million rolls of toilet paper are being flushed in the toilets. This results in about one third of a load to the sewage treatment plant. Cellulose recovery has been researched and some systems have been implemented, but they have a high capex and opex cost. At this point of time, there is no valid route for the pulp treatment that is both lucrative and environmentally sound. And the current vision in the Netherlands is that cellulose recovery is only interesting if a sewage treatment plant needs a small expansion. Mm, yeah, it works. Particles orient themselves in the direction of a water flow. If a sieve is placed at 70 to 80 degrees to the ground, which is a normal elevation, they will use the diameter of a fiber as the removal dimension. This causes the need for very small apertures, which are the holes in the sieve, typically around 350 microns. The invention of the ICABUS is based around the orientation of the sieve in the direction of the water flow, only 15 degrees to the ground. This means that not the diameter of the fiber, but its length is the removal dimension. The result is that we will get similar results at, with apertures of one to one and a half millimeter. A sieve with larger apertures has severe advantages, more open area in the sieve, causing a low pressure drop of only 10 centimeters of water column. Much easier to clean, we use a brush instead of compressed air. And the technology is way more robust. Almost no operator attention is required. At this point in the development of valid routes for the pulp, we promote digestion of the pulp. This is an easy route with low payback time and a very positive environmental impact using existing technology. Ah, okay. Um, huh? Yeah. The environmental impact has several sides. First of all, the user will get will transition from energy consumption to energy production by cellulose removal in general. Then there is the very low energy consumption of the ICABUS for both the system and the required pressure dropped over the sieve. We are dedicated in the good performance of our systems, so we will only sell the technology in combination with the process support contract, giving us access to limited data, for which in return you will get assurance that the system is always operating in its optimal window. Last but not least, we are committed to reuse and recycle all of the parts that are being used for the maintenance of the ICABUS over its lifetime. And by the end of its service, we would like to receive the complete system back for refurbishment and or validated recycling. Wrapping up, we have explained our new SEAF principle, facilitating a technology with a positive business case and a sound environmental impact. Various water boards have indicated their interest in the technology, and we are even working with companies abroad like the paper industry in South Africa and the textile industry in India. We cannot state that the technology is a game changer yet, but we are convinced it can be, and with your help, it will be. I would like to thank the Water Test Network for giving me the opportunity to test the ICABUS technology on the Apeldoorn site, especially Peter Jan van Oene. We thank you for your attention and invite you to contact us for further information. Thank you so much, uh, Franz, for your interesting uh, presentation.
the questions uh, will be at the end. So if uh, anybody has a question for uh, France or for any of the speakers, please you can write them in the chat box. And then at the end of the uh, presentations, we will be able to answer them. Thank you, Franz. So we'll move to our uh, second SME. Uh, is on improving uh, wastewater treatment in the biological uh, treatment. Uh, his name is uh, Mark Fiart, uh, sorry, from Creaqua, and he will explain us how uh, his innovation is and uh, what's the state uh, of it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Francisca. Thank you, Francisca. Uh, so, good morning, everybody. Uh, as stated, my name is Mark Feyart. I'm managing director and founder of Crea Taqua. And I would like to tell you something about wastewater use in a convenience fast food factory with our Crea Grand concept. So, a small word about Crea Taqua. Crea Taqua has been founded in 2015. Uh, and we moved slowly uh, from consultancy to, uh, let's say, construction engineering of wastewater treatment and reuse plants. Uh, we also keep the finger on the pulse concerning R&D. Uh, actually, we are working on artificial intelligence as well as resource recovery from sludge from wastewater treatment. The case I will describe you is the case of uh, treatment, wastewater treatment of a convenience fresh food factory. The customer uh, is, or the company is a global market leader in fresh foods, delivery fresh foods, uh, like fruits, vegetables, uh, also flowers. And the, specifically the location where we did the trials is uh, a, um, let's say a production site where the fruits, vegetables are finally cleaned up in order to package them <clears throat> and, they, uh, and to send as soon as possible, cheap as soon as possible to the retail and the catering. The company has its own uh, sustainability goals and uh, towards sustainability, they want globally uh, to reduce their water consumption by 10% by the end of 2025. So in this case, uh, the project fits uh, perfectly in this framework. Uh, in order to do the washing, uh, of course, they need to use drinking water quality. And a very specific uh, characteristic in this case is that the water should be always below four degrees Celsius in order to keep the quality of the fruits and vegetable at maximum. Um, actually, they're using around 120,000 cubes water, drinking water, as well as groundwater per year. And they have the forecast of increasing the consumption by 20%. Now, um, they're using groundwater. And as you know, in, uh, in a lot of countries in Europe, the groundwater is under pressure. So they are looking for uh, as much as possible wastewater use. As you see on the picture, um, the location is full of warehouses, production facilities, and there is uh, poor space availability for uh, a plant. So this means that we have to work very compact. And therefore, uh, they choose the Creagon application, um, uh, but they first wanted to demonstrate the case via pilot trials. And that's where uh, Water Test Network came in. The objectives of the pilot trial are clear. So uh, first of all, we need to have a stable biological effluent quality, which is of course very important for the steps downstream, membrane treatment. Uh, the biological uh, treatment is done with our Creagram approach. Uh, second is of course that with, when you are dealing with industrial wastewater, the variation is, 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 there's always some variation in quality, temperature, pH, especially here where during the day you have high loads and during the night you have uh, a complete other type of water because of cleaning in place procedures. So it's very important also that the system can manage these variations. And finally, the aim is of course to uh, produce a water that can be reused directly in the factory and as much as possible uh, recovery. Um, a word about the Creagan concept. 
Um, well, in fact, it is an alternative biological wastewater treatment in order to produce a sludge that is more active, more efficient, and is also denser and in the, let's say, in extenso granulated uh, from format. The benefits of it, and already proven uh, in other, uh, let's say, uh, cases, is that the energy consumption to treat the wastewater is 30% lower in general with convenient technologies. Uh, the biomass production is also lower. And uh, what is not last but not least is that for existing plants, the capacity can significantly be increased by applying the concept. Concerning the test results, um, we started with classical flocculent sludge from a domestic wastewater treatment plant. And after applying our uh, strategy, about after 100 days, we could uh, reach stable granular dense sludge into the system, which leads to uh, an SVI uh, of lower than 60 milligram per liter with a very good sludge efficiency. You also see on the backside, on the, on the downside, that the quality of the effluent is, let's say, excellent in order to treat it with a membrane system. Um, very important here, of course, is the temperature because the, the, the customer wants to keep the lower temperature as much as possible. Of course, during the treatment, you have a, a small, slight warm up but in general, we worked around 10 degrees. So this also has consequences for the load, for the efficiency of the bacteria, but we could have quite pretty loads in order to uh, treat the water. So effluent quality was good. Was also, the system was also sustainable to uh, big variations in the wastewater quality. And so the uh, treatment afterwards was pretty, I would not say easy, but was pretty, well manageable. Uh, so we reached a very good effluent quality with the classical UFRO performance, also keeping in mind again with the figures that the temperature is very low. So this means fluxes permeability are somewhat lower than expected in a normal, let's say industrial plant at normal temperatures. But finally we could uh, have, or we could attend, or we could attain the aim of more than 80% recovery of the wastewater. So job done, uh, mission accomplished. Uh, we could prove that or demonstrate that wastewater treatment was uh, stable uh, with, let's say, a good quality sludge and also water reuse, uh, uh, let's say, goals were achieved. Uh, customer was very happy. So what we did was the next steps was a basic design for the full scale plan. And very important, of course, is the business case analysis. So what we could uh, prove is that the uh, water cost can uh, be uh, lowered by almost 30% with respect to the actual situation. So now we are awaiting the decision of the company in order to move forward with the full scale plan. Finally, I would like to thank all the partners and especially uh, the Water Test Network and Vlakwa for giving us the opportunity here to show uh, what Creataqua can uh, mean to uh, companies for water use. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for your presentation and for giving us this insight on this uh, new technology on uh, to remove the the biological uh, the biology of uh, of this uh, food processing uh, water. Thank you. So now we move on. The next speaker, I would like to give the floor to Simon Langley. I don't know if I'm saying the names correctly. Sorry about this. Okay. Uh, we are uh, going to uh, hear about uh, phosphorus removal. And uh, the first speaker is going to tell us about uh, their technology. Uh, with a filter technology. Thank you, Simon, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Francesca. Um, so thank you everyone for the opportunity to present our Aquapire ultra low waste filter. Um, it was a trial that we ran at the Bowness test center with the water test network. Come on. 
control. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to very quickly have a, a look at the technology, the the filter itself, and then a little look at our trial setup, both the objectives and the site and a quick overview of some of the results that we achieved in terms of solids, waste production, and powering the unit off a micro-renewable station. Um, we'll have a quick look at the objectives of the trial and, and whether we met them, and also how we found the water test network and potential next steps. So what is our ultra-low waste filter? Well, it's a filter built specifically for smaller rural wastewater treatment plants. Um, what we found the problems in the industry at the moment are they are a lot of filter, filter cloth uh, plants for phosphorus removal that are water cleaned. And they can produce very large backwash volumes when they've removed the solids. And they also need flow in order to clean. Both of these things are not necessarily suited to small works, which can be overwhelmed by the returns of those backwash flows and also have intermittent feed flows during dry periods and overnight. Um, so this, this filter that we've, we've introduced as an innovation is an air clean system. It produces really low waste volumes. The cloth is not fully submerged, so it doesn't necessarily need the flow to clean. It also means that it's got very low power. It's very static when it's filtering. It only needs power when it actually cleans and turns. It also removes health and safety risks that water-based cloth cleaning systems have got, which you know are around biofouling, which would mean lifting out the drum cloth and stopping the machine feed, jet washing, and potentially chemical, chemical cleaning, all of which create hazards for operation and maintenance staff. Our filter overcomes those, those issues. It's a very simple machine. Uh, there's lots of the diagram there, but the, the simple part is it's a filter cloth on a drum that takes the solid particles out, which ultimately remove the phosphorus with it when combined with technologies such as algal treatment up front or um, electrocoagulation and the solids that come after that or traditional ferric and alum dosing. So the objectives of the trial that we had at Bowness were to confirm reliable operation of the filter, to run in accordance with the program and rectify any challenges, and to test powering the unit on the micro renewables with an aim of zero carbon operation. It was also to demonstrate the quality of the effluent that we achieved from the filter, both on final effluent and primary effluent. And for that, we used two 10 micron cloths. Our real aim though was to get down to less than 10 milligram a litre suspended solids on the final effluent in average, because that, as we've discussed with many water companies in the UK, is what will help them when they combine it with either algae, um, electrocoagulation or traditional dosing to achieve phosphorus contents of less than 0.5 milligrams per litre. We also wanted to demonstrate the waste volumes that are typically always less than 1% of the feed flow in our machines which is a, a factor of 10 times lower than water-based systems, and to analyze the percentage dry solids coming off the unit. And it's also to confirm the very low power usage requirements that our system has, because it's air cleaned and very static, it doesn't take a lot of backwash pumping, and also to run stably off the micro renewables over the trial. Just for the benefit of everyone, the sampling and analysis was conducted by Scottish Water and their accredited laboratory. So these are the images of the trial setup. Um, I'll draw your attention to probably just two or three of these. So if you if you if you look at image four, that is a, a picture of the uh, cloth filter itself. It's a very small unit, a model twenty five, and the open hatch is revealing the the filter cloth, the actual drum of the filter cloth. Um, I took, image seven shows the uh, renewables pack that we ran the power for the unit from. Uh, and item three shows the overall setup of the filter control panel uh, mounted behind the filter and the IBC collecting the waste. So I'm going to give you a very quick snapshot of the results we achieved on the final effluent uh, on one of the two cloths that we tested. So the black line and the axis to the right shows the flow rate we ran at uh, ramping up from 
one cube an hour to two and a half, up to three and a half. Um, the orange line is the feed solids onto the machine and the blue is the filtrate coming off. Basically, the effluent from the cloth was less than eight milligram a litre at all flows with an average of five and a half. This is against a peak solids loading rate of 0.2 kilograms per metre square per hour, which is very much in line with the design that we expect on average for this size of filter. When we looked at settled primary effluent, a slightly different application for the machine, we're not necessarily interested in the effluent quality, we're more interested in the removal rate of the total suspended solids. And for the feeds that were fairly variable, again, against the same flow ranges, we achieved an average of 42% reduction. This was at an average loading rate though of 0.42 kilograms per meter square per hour, so much higher than the, the final effluent feed. Looking at the waste volumes, again, on both final and primary effluent at the three flows, in most cases, the waste was less than 0.5% of the feed flow, which is really low. That's, you know, that's over 10 times lower than water-based systems. Um, on primary, it, it increased slightly, which you'd expect because the amount of solids you're placing onto the machine are, are quite high. So it will, it will clean more frequently, but because it's air cleaned, it produces still very low waste volumes. The sort of volumes from each clean were typically four to six litres. As we set out, we tried to run the unit off a micro renewables pack rather than off the mains. And to do this, we placed a three KVA inverter um, together with two 370 watt uh, frame mounted solar panels and a 500 watt wind turbine. Those were there delivering power to a battery bank, um, which then ultimately powered the unit. Our unit is a low, low power usage unit. It typically draws 7.8 amps and uses around 0.62 kilowatt hours a day. That's our theoretical design. And we measured the actual on site, despite it being powered off the micro renewable at 7.34 amp draw and 0.64 kilowatt hours a day, which is great because it gives us real confidence that our design parameters and the unit actually operate in the field closely correlate. So when we look back at the achievements of the trial objectives, the first one was operation. And the feedback from the, the Scottish water operators was that the aquapire filter was simple to operate and robust. The control of our unit was very straightforward with only a limited number of HMI screens. So it wasn't particularly complex. The effluent quality that the cloths achieved was an average of not a 4.5 milligram a litre total suspended solids for final effluent and 41% removal of, of total suspended solids on primary effluent. Both of, both of these were great results, but the final effluent result is really encouraging because when combined with either algal treatment, um, electrocoagulation or traditional dosing, we know that the unit will now achieve 0.5 milligram a litre of phosphorus or less, which is great because it opens up that phosphorus removal challenge, which is current for everyone. In terms of the waste sludge, the daily volumes were typically less than a half a percent of the feed volume, again, 10 times less than water-based systems. So for small works, that's a really important factor. And the dry solids percentage that we typically get off the waste is 0.25%. So it's very usable, very movable, very, very easy to deal with. The Model 25 filter we tested at Bone S ran on the two and a half kilowatt rated micro renewable pack successfully. Um, the positioning of the, the pack at Bone S was perhaps not ideal because of the restricted options, but basically the filter worked in agreement with the power that we would calculate, but more importantly, offered a zero carbon operation going forward, something which all water companies are striving to achieve. So quick, very quickly, how did we find the water test network? We found the application process very simple, straightforward and effective. We were really well supported by the Scottish Water Horizons team guiding us through the process and the requirements were clear and well laid out. We spent quite a bit of time with the team planning the trial to make sure that you know, everybody understood how to use the machine in the trial and, and that was done remotely uh, because of COVID. But we also, when we could, uh, held pre-meets to make sure that interfaces of connections and, 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 and power sightings 
were all taken care of. And we had re, you know, weekly and bi-weekly catch-ups, whether by, by call or visit to ensure everything ran smoothly and to, to look at observations. All in all, that was a really great, you know, great experience for, for Aqua and the ultra low waste filter, but also for the team in Scottish Water. And what we're really looking for next is um, looking for extended site trials for the unit or opportunities for the unit in the water company's network to add value from the work done to the water test net with the water test network. Um, I'll thank you very much for the time in, in overviewing the Acropia filter and I'll hand back to Francesca. Thank you so much, Simon. And nice to see how, the, how this combination of uh, technologies can, uh, can lead to an energy, more energy neutral uh, treatment. Thank you so much. So I would uh, please uh, ask our next uh, two speakers to stick to the time, please. Uh, and uh, we will still uh, keep in the phosphorus removal uh, department and we will move to an electrocoagulation technology. And I would like to introduce you to Kwame Nkrumah. I, this is a uh, very difficult, sorry. No, you got it right this time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so the floor is yours, Kwame. I'm very interested about your, your presentation as well. Thank you, Francisca. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Kwame Nkrumah from Kalina. And um, we are grateful for the opportunity to, um, to present um, our technology to you today. We, we did, obviously, um, um, funded by the WTN, uh, did some work, some wonderful work at Bowness, for which we're grateful to the site, the, the guys on site and everyone involved. Kalina is a UK company that has um, quite a foot in the, um, in the industrial market, and we are looking to make a push into the municipal's market, um, typically looking at phosphorus removal. So our technology works on the basis of um, effectively, rather than dosing chemical um, ferric or, or alum uh, ions, we, you know, we, we generate that in situ in our electrocoagulation units. And um, some of the benefits of that include um, you know, so a lot of work we did at Bowen and Shoulder, we, you know, we can remove phosphorus down to, initially we looked at 0.5 milligrams per litre, but then looked at future proofing to 0.25 as well. Um, because, you know, dealing with liquid chemicals, um, you know, a lot of safety um, handling and, and, and transportation and storage safety issues are, are, are taken care of. Um, the phosphate, uh, the sludge that you produce from um, the electrocoagulation treatment as compared to the chemical equivalent, is um, is a lot richer in um, in phosphate. You know, it's it's it, it's neater because you don't have all the counter ions that you normally do with uh, with chemical equivalents. So it makes it easier um, to 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 recycle. We are looking at um, a our carbon footprint. You know, we've commissioned a company um, to 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 look at the full scope of our carbon, just so we could show that we are comparable or better than um, than that's um, chemical solutions in the market. And again, a big, a big play is the fact that there is no need for any pH or alkalinity correction before or after treatment. We believe there's a whole life cycle saving um, to, to, the, um, to the water companies. And more importantly, especially for rural and small sites, yeah, if, if you sort of think of um, uh, five tons of ferric sulfate, you know, the active metal equivalent in there is equivalent to one kilogram of, um, of, of mild steel plate, which one can hold in the palm of one's hand. So, um, this is a, a snapshot of what the unit looks like. Fairly simple, um, very little moving parts other than sort of um, valves and whatnot. So in this unit, you've got four EC cells um, and the system fed bottom up. So um, you know, all four cells can be run independently um, of each other in series or in parallel. And it's all fully automated with very, with very little operator intervention. And that's all made possible by the control panel with one HMI. So again, fairly easy and straightforward to use. It's housed in a 20 foot container. And the reason for that is it makes it a lot easier to, um, um, to, to, to obviously move it around. There's no civil outlay required, you know, just any, any hard standing will do. As you can see, it's got this office-like working environment, which means um, you know, you've almost got a unit, but also somewhere that's ideal to work from. 
Um, and this 20 foot container can offer you treatment capacities of just shy of a thousand cube a day. So as you can see in that image in the top right corner, so that's the size of our of our sacrificial plates, which, like I said, we could hold into the you could hold in in one's hand, and that has obviously quite a lot of um, you know, safety implications for us. So um, um, our system is always going to be compared against chemical dosing because that is what is currently the principal system on the market. So in terms of performance, chemical dosing systems tend to tail of you know once you hit about one milligram per liter, and that's just because of um, mass transfer limitations. That is not the case of electrical coagulation. There's a significant cost saving with um, EC because um, again, you're not having to pump in lots of chemicals to address pH and alkalinity. Um, and we all know what the supply chain and, and, and cost and demand of chemicals are now at the minute. Um, the fact that you're not having to transport tons and tons of, um, of liquid chemicals um, or handle or store them means um, you know, you, th th there's an inherent safety saving um, or, or, or uh, to, to the operator. Uh, very little operator intervention. And like I said, we are looking at our carbon footprint, which we believe would offer significant savings, um, especially for rural sites. Uh, now, um, we also compare ourselves against conventional EC systems. And EC is not a new technology. It's been on the market for a while, but it has in the past had some of it, its shortcomings and how a supplier packages its system obviously sets you apart from, from other systems. Now, conventional systems normally go for large electrodes that are you know, all hardwired in. Our system um, is designed um, to use small electrodes. And the reason for that, as we showed in the previous slide, is that it's easier and quicker to replace your electrodes. But more importantly, we use what um, a bipolar arrangement of our anodes, that means um, all the sacrificial anodes aren't hardwired in, and that ensures that you've got um, a massive um, saving on, 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 on power. Um, the anode replacement is a lot quicker, you know, so you're talking minutes compared to conventional systems where you normally need lifting frames, two people, and hours into days of downtime. Um, of course, there's a safety, I think I've talked about this, uh, because you, you, you've only got these small electrodes to remove. Um, you're not worried about any, any implications of operators having to, you know, lift out, um, you know, heavy electrodes. Um, and again, um, electrode fouling is one of, of those um, issues that have, in my, in my opinion, held EC back. Um, so cleaners, um, 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 automatic polarity reversal um, has ensured that Electro fouling is minimized, and that obviously has an inherent um, um, uh, effect on, on, on the energy that's consumed. So um, this is some of the results, uh, a snapshot of the results we um, um, managed to get out of the trojan bonus. Um, we looked at uh, different uh, integration points, and we went in initially looking to see if we could demonstrate down to you know, removal down to 0.5 milligrams per liter. But as we did that, we thought, let's just push the ante up a little bit and look at getting down to 0.25, you know, for any future peak and sense that may well be on the horizon. And as you can see, um, you know, so although there was a significant swing in, in, in the quality of the incoming effluent, um, we managed to consistently get down to below 0.25. Uh, we tested for, and again, I uh, stress all these um, the analysis and testing was all done independently by um, Scottish Water and the accredited labs. And we tested for metals because, again, one of the uh, questions around EC is whether there's any potential um, leaching of, 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 of metals into the effluent stream. And, you know, we showed that that was not the case. We also had an added benefit of um, polishing COD down, which obviously was in our primary obje objective, but it helps. We are currently involved in a, a national off war innovation uh, challenge where we are uh, working with quite a number of the water companies to look to address phosphorus removal. So that there is a, there is scope for EC to, to do a lot more in um, in addressing phosphorus removal. Now, we sustainability is a big part of what we do, and as I mentioned before, we've um, we've commissioned an um, an external carbon audit company to look at a full scope of of, of carbon. You know, from um, so we believe that there is a saving. Um, 
um, um, in carbon, which of course is a big thing now. One of the things we all obviously are looking at is the next generation of our units, rather than you know using um, mains electricity, we are looking to see if we can um, actually use our renewable energy zone. So again, that's something that is in design in-house, and we hope we can, um, in the very near future, demonstrate that that's possible. Um, so next steps, I guess, um, what, what we, we, we are looking for opportunities to, to, to demonstrate our system in a, a, within the water um, industry. Um, we've got quite a lot of traction with other companies, but again, you know, we, we believe that uh, phosphorus, phosphorus removal is a big, um, a big issue that needs addressing. So we want to help play our part. And of course, um, I think there might be some synergies with some of the companies on here. I mean, um, um, Simon Langley's um, technology does seem to, um, you know, I think a conversation is probably to be had whether you know, we, we could work together in the near future to see what we can do, because ultimately we are, are working to the same agenda, which is to help reduce phosphorus um, that ends up back in the waterways. Thank you very much. And um, I would like to take this chance to thank everyone um, um, in, at WTN and the guys at Bonus for their help and support. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grant, for your very nice and clear presentation on your technology. It was nice to see how we can reduce our chemical uh, dosing in, the, in our waste uh, weather treatment plants. So now we are going to a complete other subject, all, all of course in the same context of wastewater treatment. We are uh, going to the odor removal. This is done by ATCAT uh, company. And uh, it will be presented by Jaco Hoekstra. And uh, I would like to give you the floor, Jaco. Yeah, thank you for your kind uh, introduction. Perfect, um, you're there. great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Jaco Hoekstra, I'm CEO of Adcat, a uh, startup founded at the end of 2019, and we stand for clean air and a clean future. We see a problem in uh, poor air quality in many industries and also in the water. Wastewater treatment uh, companies are struggling with it. Uh, the emission of unwanted malodorous organic compounds, but also, for example, ammonia, uh, various nitrogen and oxides, and also methane. And we see that the current air purification technologies do not fully abate these emissions and often suffer from, from high costs. And we do want to do something with our uh, catalytic oxidation technology. So our mission is to create a world free of harmful and malodorous industrial emissions. We want this, to do this by the combination of uh, uh, catalytic oxidation, which is a known technique. Everyone which has a car that runs on fossil fuels makes use of it. But we intensify this process by integrating these catalysts with the uh, metal structures that are 3D printed. On the left, left hand image, you see um, our catalytic reactor uh, in, in full swing, uh, in which the upper right part is, is uh, the active heart of our catalytic oxidation reactor. And these are these metal structures uh, in the uh, presented in the image in the middle. Uh, and within this structure, we integrate these oxidation catalysts. To dive a bit more on the technology, we optimize the flow pattern through the uh, catalytic oxidation reactor. We have to make sure that the contaminants uh, interact with the catalyst surface. So we optimize the flow pattern in, in that sense that this always happens in our reactor systems much better than in competing uh, catalytic ox oxidizers. Moreover, we make use of the passing glass oxidation catalyst, which ensures that we have uh, low oxidation temperatures and also due to the high thermal conductivity of the metal core of the reactor structure, we have excellent thermal properties and an energy efficient process. All in all, it gives us a very high performing uh, air abatement uh, technology with high air purification rates of above 95%. Uh, it's worthwhile to note that we patented our invention worldwide. Um, due to this process intensification that we achieved due to the combination of the 3D metal printing and oxidation catalyst, we can compete with many other techniques in the field. Uh, actually, we stand out for many uh, cases, not of all, of course, because there are many techniques and many cases around. Uh, but for the majority, we think we have a strong uh, strong case. Uh, other techniques, of course, like bio beds, which are frequently employed in uh, water purification, also in the air abatement sector over there, but also activated carbon absorption and, and scrubbers. They also have their pros and cons, but we think we have a strong case uh, by this process identification that we can treat a wide range of contaminants with a high efficiency uh, and uh, with the low uh, op operational expenditures. 
So what did we do in field testing? Uh, we went to an alternative location. This is a location that we tested our module in the field at a, a biogas production site uh, in which they produce biogas via NRO with the co-digestion of mainly manure. Um, so here you see the module in the field on the left-hand image. This contains a ventilator which extracts air from uh, the, 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 uh, the digest evaporator um, at a volumetric flow rate of 500 cubic meters per hour. Then we heat up the system up to a temperature of 350 degrees, which is the active temperature of our catalyst system. Uh, with the burner in this instance, um, and then we send it to the catalyst package dis displayed over here. And with the help of FITO that supports us during the measurements, they measured uh, the efficiency of our reactant system over uh, uh, many uh, different compounds like ammonia, uh, with the chemical, chemical composition, with the ozone, odor panel, hydrogen sulfide, and, uh, and methane. So here you see our field testing results. Uh, ammonia was reduced at a 75% efficiency. Hydrogen sulfide, the concentration of that compound was too low to be measured, so we cannot report any removal efficiency. The owner panel found an efficiency over the catalytic system of, of around 80%, but over the complete module, because the burner also had some influence of a total 98% uh, uh, efficiency. Methane was uh, converted to a limited extent, uh, but we know that if, uh, to fully abate the methane, we need to go to higher temperature because methane in, in itself is a pretty stable molecule. And in the chemical composition, a wide range of uh, compounds were found and classified in these five uh, uh, classes, uh, which various ranges of, of efficiency were found. Uh, most, the most important is the high efficiency found for silver containing compounds, which of course have a very nasty uh, smell, which which are also omnipresent in the wastewater uh, uh, treatment facilities. So to conclude, uh, we found a high air purification efficiency with this module in the field with efficiencies up to 95%. The silver containing compounds are treated very effectively. And we've also found that high humidity, or of course, uh, in many cases you find, lowers a bit the efficiency of the catalytic air purification process. But it's, this can be simple remedy just by increasing the temperature for a bit, because there's a competition between water, water vapor on the uh, adsorption to the surface of the catalyst and the contaminants. The outlook is that we are currently scaling up catalytic oxidation technologies uh, to larger volumetric flow rates, with electrifying the heating process and also integrating a heat recovery system. I think we show that uh, our technology holds potential to treat malodorous emissions from, uh, from wastewater treatment uh, and also for NI aerobic digestion processes. Uh, so feel free to reach out if you are um, having troubles with some, some uh, malodorous emissions and we can talk and discuss about it. Um, so uh, with that, I want to thank you for your kind attention and of course also the support from the Water Test Network and from Vito for joining the field testing. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jacob, for your clear presentation. And uh, hopefully it can be applied for removing these uh, odorous uh, problems in some uh, wastewater treatment plants and others. So we have come to our uh, Q&A session. I would like, uh, first of all, I have some questions here. Maybe the, uh, the speakers can turn on the camera. And I will start with Franz, uh, the first presentation. Um, Christian Bosel asks, what, the, what did not really came across is that is what the business case and pulp uh, routing will be. Can you explain a little bit more and also Charlotte asks uh, about uh, the application in the textile industry to remove specific solids before further wastewater treatment. Maybe you can start with the first one of the business case and uh, the pulp routing. I have the same question as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, Francisca, thank you. And Christian Beuzel, also thank you for the question. Um, by the way, Christian helped a lot in the W2N proceedings as well. So uh, thank you, Christian. Sorry, I forgot you. I only meant PTM. Um, business case, yeah. If you remove the pulp, um, uh, I've just, uh, earlier this year, a paper has been pr uh, presented uh, showing that 80% of the cellulose out of the pulp actually is being digested in the, in the aeration tank. That means, um, well, pulp is not 
completely cellulose. So about 70% of the COD in the pulp that we take out normally is digested, which takes energy for aeration and creates about uh, half of the COD is transferred into biomass, so blue sludge, which is a great cost and a great environmental impact because in the Netherlands we uh, we, we have to burn it. Uh, we can't put it on the, on, uh, on the soil. So uh, the environmental impact and the costs attached to the uh, aeration and the sludge are uh, high. And uh, instead, we take the pulp and we put it in a bioreactor. And then uh, you can make, ideally, you make green gas out of it. So you upgrade the biogas to green gas. And the business case for that currently at the, with the current uh, gas prices, that's a very swift payback. Uh, but even if, uh, if you have a, a heat power combine, a combination unit, um, there's still a payback of, of four to five years. So um, uh, it is tremendously lucrative to remove the pulp before it goes into the biology and avoiding all that COD uh, to be uh, well transferred uh, which is very bad uh, for the environment. Uh, research has shown that it takes about uh, 1100 um, kilo of CO2 per ton of uh, uh, pulp that we take out. So uh, if, if you take the route to digestion and making biogas. So it's very good for the environment and it's very good for your wallet as well. So short papers. Thanks, Ferenc. And the second question in the textile industry, to remove specific solids before further wastewater treatment. Yeah, um, well, we're looking at flows that have high um, uh, fiber content and high flows. And uh, pulp and paper is one of the uh, areas, and we will do another uh, W2N test on a pulp and paper factory, uh, but also textile. I, uh, an ex-colleague for me um, called me out of India and he said, uh, we have issues with fibers in textile. And we started brainstorming about what can we do with it? Of course, um, the ICABUS itself will take out all the fibers from, from the textile mill. So that's, that's an easy application. Um, but if the textile um, is pigment based, and we have a cake layer of the fibers, we actually will remove um, some of the pigments as well. And if you do a flocculation ahead of it, uh, then you can even do uh, remove reactive um, dyes. As long as they're being transformed in a, uh, in a solid, we can uh, remove it with uh, high um, uh, efficiencies. In the pulp and paper, the first uh, pilot test we did was 83% TSS removal, which was humongous. And we expect even higher numbers in the uh, textile industry because the length of the fiber is even more, much more uh, longer in, in a textile application. Great, thank you, Franz. Uh, we'll move on to um, the next uh, SME, Create Aqua. Uh, I would like to ask you, Mark, about uh, the, if the application of this technology is only for steady rates of uh, COD, or if can if, if can still be applied if in the case of uh, more unstable rates? Of course, uh, it's uh, it's a biology. So uh, let's say the general rules for a biology they uh, they remain. Huh? Uh, of course, if you have a, a big variety in uh, in wastewater quality. In general, you use a buffer tank. That's the first point. And then it's it's a matter of a good design of your uh, buffer tank, of your biology, in order to manage that. But um, in fact, it's the same. The same rules of thumb are valid for this type of system uh, with respect to classical systems. And what would you need to 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 have a for your next step to like improve in a, and go further in the, your TRL as a, as a next step for your for your SME? Well, um, let's say that <clears throat> what we did already parallel to this, uh, this demonstration unit, we optimized already some full scale plants, mm -hmm. existing industrial plants where we, where we in fact see what also I explained in one slide about the benefits. So we, 
we, we in fact all the information uh, we got from from these plants uh, I put them in in the in the slide of the Grea Gram explication where we can uh, receive 30 percent savings on energy and sludge mm -hmm. so we parallel to that we managed already to optimize it the uh, challenge in in the bespoke case of the, uh, the the vegetable processing factory was especially the low temperature so in most of the cases that we did so far temperature is no issue mm -hmm. uh, in this case it was and and that was for us a challenge to see if let's say the the knowledge that we have built up already parallel uh, in industrial plants could be applied also to this case. So um, I also believe that um, what we demonstrate here can be applied in any other type of sector or, or industry. It's a matter of sometimes time to start up. It's also a matter of what is, what, which compounds might be uh, uh, harming the bacteria, but in fact, the general knowledge can be applied to classical systems. If you have toxic compounds, the bacteria will not work, the nitrification will go down. In fact, it's the same. The only uh, way how we do it here is that, that we apply another approach to treat the wastewater so that we select another type of bacteria that, that uh, moves into the format of granules. But the basic knowledge, the basic reaction uh, kinetics are more or less the same for classical systems with respect to this one. Thank you so much, Mark. And um, I also got a question for uh, Simon from uh, Aqua, but I think he also answered it. Uh, maybe you want to uh, say something more about it. The question was, um, what was then the final uh, phosphorus concentration in the effluent? And that, uh, of course, is happy to collaborate uh, further with uh, with you. Yeah, sure. I don't know if you can help me to turn on my video. It won't let me. I think you've <laughs> you've blocked it. It might be the <laughs> face you don't want to see, which is fine. Uh, well, maybe now. Okay. Yeah, that's working. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's no problem. Um, yeah. So in, in the U S we've done trials with ferric and polymer, and we've actually achieved phosphorus levels down to 0 0.075 when combining the two, but you know, in the UK, we've achieved 0 0.5 milligram a litre just using ferric alone. Um, I think, you know, very much along the lines of, of, of Kwame's point though, you know, we are trialing the, the system now with algal technology. And also we've been, you know, talking to one or two uh, electrocoagulation uh, people about the solids that may come off their systems at the end, just for a polish, a straight solids polish to get away from uh, chemically based phosphorus removal. So I hope that, I hope that helps and yeah, more than happy to collaborate on, on future opportunities. Simon, sounds uh, sounds great. And um, then moving to uh, Kwame. Uh, yeah, just I think I've muted myself now. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, um, uh, thanks um, for for the question. I guess um, we so on a twenty year life cycle sort of cost comparison. We um, at the minute. Uh, we've we worked out about 28% saving um, compared to sort of dosing chemicals. But what we've also done is looked at, um, and we, we're doing some work with um, with um, uh, Water UK to look at the, the, the forecast or the future outlook for, for supply and demand and cost of chemicals. And, um, you know, they, they've got projections for what the, uh, there's projections around the cost of chemicals probably doubling or even more. So when when you saw if you saw look at the forecast, um, we, we've projected that it'll probably be up to fifty one percent saving, um, um, and that's taken into account the high energy um, cost as well. One thing we've not taken into account, which would work in our favour if we could find a way to do so, is we know um, electric what well, certainly the grid is decarbonizing a lot faster than um, than, than, than transport network. So and and energy is obviously 
one of the biggest contributors to our total um, our toll tax. Um, for example, I think last year Scotland, um, um, I think the technical expression is Scotland hosted more green energy than it, it, it used. So there is scope for for more green and renewable energy to be um, to, to be available for to power up our units. And if that's the case, I think we could even drive up that um, the savings even even more significantly. Uh, hopefully, Charlotte, that answers your question. I hope, uh, Charlotte. Maybe if you want to uh, to unmute yourself, uh, that's also fine. Yes, that perfectly yeah. answers my question. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you. And the last question is uh, for Atka Yako. Uh, uh, it was uh, from uh, Daypak. It says, "Can you please clarify the below one reaction time?" Fall air required with catalyst two catalyst replacement time. Yeah. Um, that's a fairly quick answers. Uh, the resonance times right now in the current uh, catalyst bed that we tested that is 500 cubic meters per hour um, amount to a resonance time of the, the, the molecules within the catalyst bed of about 0.01 seconds. And this is mainly limited due to mass transfer limitations. If, if such a molecule interacts with the catalyst surface, this uh, reaction time is very quickly. It's, it's just you have to get it into uh, onto the inner channels and onto the surface of the catalyst. Uh, we think we can improve this. We are continuously developing and, 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 um, and trying to test new structures. So we think we, they, we can still improve on that. Uh, regarding the catalyst replacement time, um, in principle, a uh, catalyst should always work, but uh, in, in, uh, as a matter of fact, it will always uh, deteriorate along, uh, along the time. And we think um, we can use it for uh, about two years and then we have to replace the catalyst. And this does not, not necessarily mean that we have to completely uh, throw away the whole catalyst package because we have an, uh, a protocol developed that we can wash away the catalyst coating and apply a fresh one. So you can uh, remain your structure, you can uh, reuse those. Uh, and, and of course, because the catalyst material is pretty expensive, um, this uh, uh, yeah, can also be recovered and reused. Um, there was another additional question. Um, how much is the maximum dynamic uh, PPMs of uh, H2S that can be treated without your uh, with your proposed system? Um, so we. So yeah, the maximum concentration. So in principle, yeah. uh, we don't see uh, any limitations with that. Uh, on lab scale, we uh, uh, not in the field. Usually the concentrations are a bit lower, but on lab scale, we tested at hundreds of PPMs and uh, the system still works. In principle, you always uh, achieve the same uh, reduction percentage. So that's uh, uh, independent of the concentration that goes into the system. So several hundreds up to a few thousands. Uh, and, uh, and so it's safe to say that we can still treat those. What would be uh, what you need to move to uh, to scale up uh, this into more uh, uh, cubic meters per per, uh, per hour? In principle, we just need a better catalyst system, a better bigger pump system. But for, uh, the main issue right right now that we're looking into it for now, the testing is fine, the, the results are there. Uh, they still need to be improved a bit. We are not fully there where we were, but we know what uh, what not to turn to improve uh, the efficiency, uh, mainly for the business case of customers also to integrate a heat recovery system, uh, because yeah, we need to have an elevated temperature and the more cubic meters per hour that you need to treat, uh, the higher your uh, energy penalty will be. So that's the main uh, issue, but this is common technology. So we're partnering up with some, some people, uh, some other companies to integrate that into our system. Thank you. And uh, is there any more questions uh, for our presenters in the audience? No? Well, then uh, I think uh, we, we are still a bit behind in time. Sorry for that. 10 minutes uh, uh, a bit longer. So, uh, but I think it was uh, nice also to have a bit of a conversation after the presentations to solve and uh, check uh, for some uh, next steps and uh, see what uh, what is what you need actually to fully 
scale up your technologies. I would really like to thank you all for your uh, very nice and clear presentations and to see how you are really striving to get this uh, technologies uh, into the into the market so i would like to thank you all and uh, i would like also to invite you to our final event during the european water tech uh, week this september uh, the wtn will have a a, a nice uh, final event so you are of course all welcome to attend and uh, i would like to Again, thank you all the participants for sticking in, in the meeting and uh, doing making all these questions. Very nice to see. Thank you so much. And I wish you a very nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.